Well, let's start with the point that Jensen made, the tremendous impact that TSMC has had. Not only uh, it, the creation of the fabulous semiconductor uh, industry that I think couldn't exist without, without that leadership, but also the tremendous impact it had on the Taiwan semiconductor manufacturing and really being the spearhead for the growth of that industry. Did you anticipate those kinds of changes when you began the company? Did you think you could have that kind of impact around the world? No, uh, not at all, John. Actually, um, the uh, very uh, idea, the, the new business model, uh, the pure play foundry business model, uh, now everybody uh, thinks that uh, it was a pretty clever idea. Uh, but at the time, it was really a solution that was looking for a problem. Uh, uh, because, um, as uh, Jensen said, it was, a, it was meant to be a platform. The problem was that at the time, nobody needed that platform. There were very few fabulous companies in existence at that time. There were maybe 20 some fabulous companies. Now, even those fabulous companies did not think that they needed a TSMC. Uh, but they, they, they felt that they would rather go to Toshiba, NEC, Hitachi, Fujitsu, or even Intel, or TI for uh, fab service, foundry service. Now, of course, I mean, those big guys, uh, the the uh, Japanese companies, the Intels and TIs, uh, really didn't want them, you know. And they would make stuff, make wafers for for the the little fabulous companies only at a, a very steep price, not a financial steeper price, but the price of wanting their designs uh, for their own sales, for their own product sales. But still. Uh, we were not trusted enough, our technology was not trusted enough uh, that uh, they would uh, come to us. So, uh, uh, and the big companies obviously obvious didn't need us. Now, so it was a solution waiting for a problem to happen. Now, the, the problem happened uh, pretty quickly uh, in the early 90s, uh, and I think that our existence certainly uh, uh, helped uh, to accelerate the formation of a lot of fabulous companies. Uh, there were maybe 25 fabulous companies in the whole world in 1985, 86, and then 10 years later, there were 400, 500 fabulous companies. And some of the big ones uh, were started uh, in that period, in that 10 year period. Yeah. I mean, having worked in a fabulous company, been involved in starting two of them, one before TSMC that had to do exactly as you say, go form partnerships with the big players who, this was not their primary business, and then forming one at Theros with TSMC. It was yeah. night and day. Yeah. Completely different yeah. kind of experience. Right. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, right. Right. I so know. Talk, about the, talk about the impact on Taiwan as well. I mean, the, the catapulting of, of Taiwan into the semiconductor manufacturing business in a big way. I, I think in many ways uh, we uh, were the first in Taiwan. Uh, we, we were not the first uh, semiconductor company in mm -hmm. Taiwan. Taiwan had uh, other semiconductor companies uh, before TSMC started. Uh, but uh, uh, we certainly became the most successful semiconductor company uh, in Taiwan uh, after a few years, uh, after only a few years. And uh, also, uh, we, I think that uh, we, we really set a model, uh, I hope, uh, uh, for Taiwan in corporate governance, in um, uh, innovations. Uh, um, uh, you know, most, most, almost 95, 90, 
nine percent of Taiwan companies operate with uh, hair thin gross margin. You know, mm -hmm. gross margin four or five percent, uh, and uh, they don't have money for R&D. They don't even have money for sales marketing. For for heaven's sake, with four or five percent gross margin, and, and uh, we, I believe, were the first company that showed them that. Uh, uh, to to be a world-class company, to be a real successful company, you needed to have R&D, you needed to have good sales marketing, and uh, and because you needed to have R&D, your gross margin would ha would have to be in the 40, 50 percent range. Right. Yeah. Uh, so we we I think we set the first example, and on corporate governance, uh, you know. I believe that we uh, we set an example also. Uh, uh, so I think uh, TSMC uh, did uh, 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 begin to acquire a, a, a different meaning in, in, in Taiwan as a corporation. Yeah. So uh, tell me, I think Jensen alluded to this focus, and you said it too, pure play. This focus on manufacturing excellence Mm -hmm. On R and D in manufacturing, designed to bring new semiconductor uh, lines to mm -hmm. to uh, production faster. H how did you uh, get decide to focus on that? How did that become the central focus point for TSMC? Well, uh, because um, one thing, uh, one reason, in fact, maybe the principal reason was that uh, um, I, at the time I started a TSMC. I had already worked in the industry, semiconductor industry, for 30 years. Right. I, I, I joined the industry in 1955 and started the TSMC in 1985. Uh, and I had already been uh, the head of the largest semiconductor operation business in the world, Texas Instruments. Yeah. Right. yeah. So. Um, uh, there was a, a, a Song Dynasty Chinese poem that said that, that uh, to be the leader, the first thing you have to do is to climb to the top of uh, a high building and look down on all the available roads in the world. And I, I, I did that actually at TI. Uh, I, I occupy perhaps the most, the height, the height of the industry, yeah. and, and look at the, the, all the available routes. Uh, and there wasn't really any for a newcomer to <laughs> compete, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to figure out a new road, uh, and the new road was this new business model. Yeah. But then, of course, the problem was that it was a solution looking for a problem, but happily the problem occurred. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, I, I think and Jensen was, was was one of the problems. Yeah, yeah. that's right. That's right. One of the yeah. good problems that occurred. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you undersell this point, Mars, because there were some earlier attempts at silicon foundries, but they had mixed business models. They were CAD tools combined with companies that had manufacturing lines, or they, and they never put the focus on manufacturing excellence. I think Jensen hit on trust. You want, you yeah. want your customers for to trust yeah. TSMC, you yeah. better be manufacturing yeah. excellence. Yeah, I, uh, that certainly, and I, I, I mean, I owe a lot to uh, a, a lot of people. Uh, I, I owe a lot uh, to my, uh, my own uh, family, my own early, upbringing, uh, which uh, did uh, instill in me uh, values of uh, integrity and uh, being trustworthy and, uh, and uh, so on. I owe a lot to the education uh, I received, uh, Stanford. Uh, uh, and uh, Stanford, I, although I spent only two and a half years, well, I, should, I must mention, Harvard and MIT yes, as well. Right, uh, right. Uh, exactly. And, uh, but but uh, but the, the the two and a half years I spent I spent at Stanford getting my PhD I think were uh, very important years, decisive years for me, uh, because um, 
I, I had started to work already in the semiconductor industry before I came to Stanford for my PhD. And I, I, ha I have to say now that before I started working, my studying at MIT was really not serious. I, I really didn't know what I wanted in life. <laughs> but then I started working and I knew what I wanted now uh, when I came to Stanford. I have been at TI, I've been in industry for six years already. Uh, and I have been at TI for three years. And I was on the rise at TI. Yeah. And they sent me to Stanford to get my PhD. I already knew what I wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I was a very, very diligent and serious and hardworking student. Uh, <laughs> that was the, the only time I was a hardworking, <laughs> diligent, serious student. <laughs> So I'm sure the students would yeah. like to know the secret of finishing a PhD in two and a half years. <laughs> Be, being diligent and how working. Good, good, good. That's the right answer. <laughs> yeah. So tell me how the pieces of your education fit together. As you said, you were at Harvard first, and then you, you switched to MIT. Right, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. and, then, and, then, and then went to work before you came here. Yeah. How did, how, what happened there? Why did you switch from Harvard to MIT? Harvard's not such a bad place to get a degree from. <laughs> not at all. It was, in fact, uh, even, even now, I consider that to be my most ex exciting year. Uh, uh, it was, uh, I was freshman. I just spent the freshman year. But remember, the time was uh, 1949 to 1950. Mm. And uh, there were very, very few um, Chinese, um, uh, there, were, there was no Chinese American, Chinese American uh, politician, there was no Chinese American even businessman. Uh, there were Chinese uh, American uh, laundry people, there were uh, Chinese American restaurant people. Mm. Uh, uh, now, the only um, uh, really uh, serious uh, profession, I would say middle class profession, that a Chinese American could uh, pursue uh, in the early 50s would be technical, you know, mm -hmm. research or, or Development, uh, engineering, engineering work. Yeah. So, although although Harvard uh, was at first was a very exciting year, uh, but the Harvard didn't even have engineering as mm. as a special as a specialty. Uh, uh, Harvard the un the undergraduates were were general education. Mm. I didn't think I could um, uh, find a, a job a, a good job anyway uh, if I uh, got a bachelor's degree at Harvard. Uh, so I, I <laughs> we probably would have still let you in, Morris. <laughs> well, so so I switched to uh, MIT the second year, uh, uh, and I, I switched to mechanical engineering. Yeah, oh. and then uh, as I said, I I really wasn't all that interested in in mechanical engineering or in engineering uh, uh, at all. I was a lot more interested in, in politics, business, uh, economics, general things, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why Harvard was far more interesting to me than MIT turned out to be. But I, I, uh, I actually, I went on, of course, anyway. And in fact, I wanted to get uh, a PhD at MIT. Mm. However, uh, I failed uh, the PhD qualifying exam. <laughs> And uh, they, they allow you to take it twice, you know. Uh -huh. uh, I think it's the same rule as Stanford there. Yeah. They allow you to, to take it twice, and mm -hmm. I failed fail both times. <laughs> so what was I to do? Uh, and I decided that uh, I would just go to work. And um, I was uh, kind of sick and tired of mechanical engineering anyway. <laughs> so I, I went to work for a new semiconductor company. Uh -huh. Sylvania, uh, 
And uh, then uh, after three years at Sylvania, the new semiconductor division of Sylvania, uh, uh, after three years, and I remembered one classic address that the general manager of that division gave to all his uh, indirect employees. And, uh, and there were maybe 150 of us. Uh, well, we were gathered in the uh, cafeteria, and uh, he said he made uh, one classic comment that I remember to this day. He said, our trouble, our trouble at Sylvania is that we cannot make what we can sell, and we cannot sell what we can make. <laughs> <laughs> now, ever, ever since then, I've tried to stay away from that. <laughs> <laughs> at TI later, and of course at TSMC, yeah. and I've, I've, I should say, I've successfully stayed away. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's why TI yeah. and TSMC around <laughs> Sylvania isn't. So. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So tell me about tell me about the time when you first when you first returned to Taiwan. Uh, you headed I first, Ytre, I first right? went to Taiwan. Went to Taiwan. Uh, yeah, right. Yes, went to I, Taiwan. I, I, Taiwan right. was a strange place to me, uh, uh, a new place, That's a strange right. place, uh, when I first went there in 1985. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, and that was the first time you had actually been there. Well, I had visited it a okay. few times. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. So you returned to head Etri, to head this uh, industrial right. group that yeah. the government had. Right. Yeah. Tell me about that time and how that influenced your view of the semiconductor industry and what could happen in Taiwan. The uh, you mean Etri? Uh, it, at Etri. Etri had had um, a semiconductor uh, uh, pilot line, uh, actually semiconductor development uh, project. For ten years, uh, mm. uh, ever since 1975, uh, from 19, in 1975, the the premier of Taiwan, the prime minister of Taiwan, had the foresight to uh, start a semiconductor development project in Taiwan, in Itri, in this uh, industrial technology research institute in in Taiwan. And uh, it, get, it got its uh, technology, well, it sent out invitation for bits uh, uh, for people, American companies, to transfer technology, semiconductor technology, to, to, to Itri. And there were several bidders, and uh, the winning bidder was uh, RCA. Um, so, um, it got its uh, technology, early technology, CMOS technology, uh, from uh, RCA. And then from that point on, uh, they started to follow, uh, uh, to continue to, to develop their technology. The problem was that it was only a development project. Mm. So uh, the RCA technology was about one generation old anyway, one generation behind when it was transferred to Itri. And uh, then when I arrived in 1985, which was 10 years after they started, uh, they had become two generations behind. Mm. Uh, I mean, in spite of their very hard work, but uh, you know, they just couldn't keep up with the, with the, the technology progress that uh, a uh, a that most other semiconductor companies uh, in the U.S. at that time did. Um, um, so we we started TSMC uh, started with with that technology with the Itri technology, which was two generations behind the current technology. But uh, we managed to um, to start to uh, catch up. Uh, and uh, I would say that it took us perhaps uh, 10 years, uh, the first 10 years of TSMC. And now, of course, you know, we, had, we, we start to have uh, enough business volume to support a, a, a much higher level of R&D mm. than Itri could. Uh, right. uh, yeah. So how did you, the thought of starting 
a semiconductor manufacturing company and the capital that requires seems quite daunting. How did you get, how did you get that company launched? Well, uh, the government uh, first promised to be the to be uh, a fifty percent the, the largest uh, investor, fifty percent up to fifty percent, and uh, so it was my job to get the other fifty percent. Mm. Of course, uh, it turned out that uh, even though the premier promised uh, that uh, the government would invest uh, 50 percent in TSMC, I still had to get the bureaucracy's uh, uh, <laughs> agreement, uh, which, which took uh, actually uh, not, not just a few months, but also a lot of uh, heartache. Yes, you know, yeah. patience of a saint. Patience, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, of course, uh, the harder part, of course, was to get the other 50%. And, um, uh, and the premier told me that I needed to get a, uh, a, uh, a technology, a uh, multinational technology company to be uh, an anchor investor. Mm. Uh, and then if I, if I get this uh, uh, multinational technology uh, company, uh, to be the anchor investor, then uh, it would be easier. He would help me uh, to get the rest uh, from Taiwan business community. So I spent about, about uh, eight months uh, to get uh, Phillips. Well, actually, I had written letters, letters to a lot of people, Intel, TI, mm -hmm. uh, Toshiba, Hitachi, NEC, uh, Sony, uh, <laughs> uh, well, uh, and uh, actually, uh, three companies uh, uh, gave me uh, 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 presentation opportunities. Intel mm -hmm. did, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. I wrote to Gordon Moore, and uh, Gordon wrote back that, uh, that he said that uh, I, I have asked uh, Craig Barrett, mm -hmm. who was at that time his uh, uh, CTO, I think, uh, uh, to see me. So I talked to uh, Craig twice, uh, two separate occasions. But uh, at the end of the uh, second occasion, he said, no, we're not interested. And TI the same way. Uh, saw him twice, saw TI twice. I went to Dallas uh, twice. Uh, and the same way, uh, at the end of the second meeting, he said, no. Mark Shepard said no. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> Too bad for him, huh? <laughs> well, uh, and uh, then, but the only company that uh, appeared to be interested, uh, genuinely interested, was Philips. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, and uh, well, I, I had wanted uh, somebody better in technology, and uh, Philips. <laughs> In terms of semiconductor technology, I, I had described them as being um, in the first row of second raters. <laughs> but uh, I, I had to settle. I had to settle for them. Yeah. Yeah, uh, interesting. So I, I got them. I got them, uh, and they invested 28 percent. So I had uh, 48 percent. It turned out to be 48 percent from the government, Taiwan government, 28 percent from uh, Philips. And then the remaining 23, 24 percent, I guess, I got from from about 12 or 13 companies, uh, and that was very interesting too. What what generally happened was that uh, one of the ministers uh, in the government would uh, call uh, a businessman in Taiwan and uh, told him that uh, uh, he would send me to give a presentation to that uh, businessman, mm -hmm. to get him to invest. So I was on that kind of trips, uh, you know, a dozen times. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and there was uh, one pretty big investor, a 5% investor, um, that, uh, that actually bought uh, when the Minister of Economic Affairs in Taiwan, first called him and told him that uh, he wanted to send me. He said, OK. Mm -hmm. So I went there actually three times, three separate times. Um, 
And uh, I mean, he and he had, he and his staff uh, sat down with me for dinner, and uh, none of the, those people knew anything about semiconductors. <laughs> but they would they would keep quizzing me, you know, at dinner, and I I didn't even I wasn't even able to I didn't even have time to eat anything. <laughs> but and uh, it was you know twice. This happened two times, dinner two times, dinner and the interrogation, <laughs> so two times. And then he called the uh, Minister of Economic Affairs, the, uh, the, big, the big businessman, called the minister back and said, no, 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 I'm not going to invest. Well, the minister, of course, uh, was unhappy, but uh, he, 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 he told the premier that. The premier said, let me call this guy. And so the premier told me later that he, he, he called uh, this guy. Uh, and uh, he, he, the premier also told me, uh, he said, I told him, the government has been very good to you in the last 20 years. You better do something. You better do something for the government now. <laughs> Well, that works. That works. That works. Any way you can get the that money, works. I guess. It's, that uh, worked. Yeah, that worked. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, when you look at this, mm -hmm. you look at what's happened historically, it's mm -hmm. really fascinating because in the, in the late 70s and early 80s, I think it, it, there was this thought that Japan would take over the entire semiconductor industry. Yeah. And in fact, that, hasn't what's, that has not been what's happened. In fact, there was the rise of TSMC and Taiwan semiconductor industry. Then main, now mainland China, Korea, obviously. How have you? How did this? How do you see what what really caused this kind of evolution and these changes? Well, I, I really think that the, the problem with the, the Japan with the Japanese industry was that uh, they never uh, created a, a a fabulous industry. Right. It was the fabulous industry in the United States that came up uh, with all the innovations, right. almost all the innovations right. uh, 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 in the last 20 years. Uh, so, I mean, there was this uh, uh, industry, Japanese semiconductor industry uh, uh, conference, oh, five, six years ago. And um, I was invited to attend, but I was not invited to participate in um, a panel uh, that they had. So the panel, the panelists were all the Japanese uh, industrialists, semiconductor industrialists, sitting up there discussing that they wanted the government to um, to fund a common fab for them now, <laughs> like TSMC. Uh, <laughs> that's what they said, you know, up on the stage. And I was sitting downstage. I, I was really getting very impatient. <laughs> but, uh, and uh, then uh, finally, finally, they stopped talking, and uh, the chairman of the of the panel asked uh, if if the, anybody in the audience uh, wanted to make any comment. So I raised my hand, I said, <laughs> <laughs> and they all knew me anyway. I said, I don't think your problem was uh, was not having a common fab, huh? Your problem was that you just never had a a fabulous company. It was the fabulous companies, you know, yeah. that uh, the, the, the big difference that has occurred in the last, uh, uh, at that time, it was, uh, I think, something like two, 2005. Between 1985 and 2005, the 20 year time period, the um, Japanese um, market share had dropped uh, 20 percent, 20 points. And the American market share had gone up 20 points. Mm. And the fabulous, in the meantime, all American, went from zero to 20%. Right, right. And that was the difference. Yeah. 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 Well, not only did they <laughs> yeah. didn't do that, but they also, yeah. didn't, they also didn't go into the hardcore foundry business, the pure play foundry business, which they could have done. They had the technology early on. They were good at the manufacturing side, but they... They decided not to do it, I guess. Uh, yeah, but well, I wouldn't have welcomed them to that. I know you would. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> they were afraid of you, Morris. I, I would have welcomed them to, to create a fabulous industry yeah. that we could then serve. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. No doubt. Uh, uh, 
I, so yeah. one thing I, I, I know that you also have a great uh, love and appreciation of the arts and, and the humanities. You mentioned your year at Harvard. Tell me how that's affected you, your leadership, your, the style with which you've led TSMC. Uh, it certainly uh, has uh, made uh, my life uh, a lot more interesting. Uh, I, uh, I do, I am interested in um, both uh, English and Chinese literature, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm interested in uh, classical music. Mm -hmm. So uh, my, whatever leisure time I have, I, I will read uh, Chinese literature, English literature. In fact, the two books that I have uh, uh, very near to my bed, um, I, I, I read them uh, uh, usually, you know, in the, uh, in the hour uh, uh, or two, uh, uh, when I was too tired to read uh, anything serious. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the two books, uh, one is Chinese, it's the Red Chamber Stream, uh, it's a Chinese classic. Uh, and the other is uh, Shakespeare's plays. Uh, and, uh, and I'm particularly interested in the in Shakespeare's tragedies, mm. and I mean, there's a lot of meaning. I think uh, a lot of uh, life life's lessons uh, in uh, Shakespeare's play. Uh, and I'm interested in music. I'm interested in history in general, in biography, uh, and uh, all those. I think add a great deal to uh, to to my life's interest. I think, and I think that uh, my business. Um, um, uh, experience, uh, I think, benefits from uh, some of these uh, uh, lessons uh, that I learned in outside reading, too. Uh, uh, I often compare, uh, I, 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 I am a student of the, uh, the Second World War, the, the main battles and so mm -hmm. on. I often, I often compare uh, the competitive battles that TSMC goes through with uh, competitors, compare them with uh, the the battles in the Second World War, huh. uh, Stalingrad, and yeah. all the stuff. Uh, the, uh, Stalingrad, that's a tough mid, one to start with. Mid, the mid, siege of Leningrad. <laughs> Staling, Stalingrad was uh, was yeah. the one I was very interested in yeah. because. Uh, uh, well, actually, the midway, uh, the uh, the naval, naval battle. Yeah, battle. You know, the the Japanese commander couldn't make up his mind yeah. whether to keep the uh, the bombers uh, on deck or uh, the fighters on right. deck. You know? uh, and he changed it. He, he changed yeah, he mind. changed. Well, and you know that too. Yeah, <laughs> he changed. He changed it, and that 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 cost him the battle. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, Indecision is a very bad thing in war is, and in leading companies. That's right. right, right. <laughs> that's right, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, final mm. question before we open up the floor. Uh -huh. What advice would you give to the students who are here who seek to have some impact, have a life that really achieves, achieves great things? And many of them, will, most of them will be in some engineering discipline. What advice would you give them? Learn and think. Both are important. Uh -huh. Both are important. Very, uh, uh, very, well, here I, I go to a Confucian uh, uh, statement. Uh, learning and uh, thinking are both important. If uh, you just learn and don't think, then you quickly become lost. Uh, if you just think and don't learn, then you quickly run out of material to think. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, let's open up the floor for, we have 15 minutes or so for questions. Um, and do we have mics or what do we have here, Jim? Okay. The conditions you describe at, at the founding of TSMC are very similar to the conditions that exist today in the MEMS industry. Mm. And I know I'm that sorry, I have a little trouble oh. hearing you. Yeah. Could you be a little louder, perhaps? Is the mic on? Hello? 
There it is. Okay. So I was saying the conditions that existed at the start of TSMC are very similar to the conditions that exist currently in the MEMS industry. And I know that... In what industry? In MEMS. 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 Electromechanical. Uh-huh. So, and I know TSMC is doing business in MEMS now. It's a very small part of your revenue. But I was curious what your vision is for MEMS for TSMC, and particularly whether you think TSMC can standardize MEMS the way it did for CMOS technology. Mm -hmm. Can TSMC standardize MEMS? Standardize the MEMS tech base technology, I guess, right? That's really the key. Standardize? Yeah, uh, create a standard base technology on which MEMS That's, can that's be what built. we hope to do. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, that's, that's true, isn't it? Uh, Mark, uh, Mark is uh, yeah, one of our co CEOs. Uh, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And I, I really think that MEMS uh, is a very major part of uh, what we call, in general, the next big thing. You know. The current big thing is uh, all these smartphones and tablets, the mobile product. What is the next big thing? Well, the next big thing, I don't know exactly what it is. I, I guess it's, it's probably uh, the internet of things, the wearables and, and those things. Uh, but whatever, uh, yeah, I think, I think it's very probably the internet of things and the uh, wearables. Anyway, MEMS will play a big part in those. So we, we really have high hopes. Uh, for MEMS, uh, TSMC has high hopes for MEMS. Well, and you, Morris, you did achieve this in the mobile industry. In the beginning, there weren't standards, particularly for the analog side of it, and you needed analog to go into the mobile business. And you did become a leader in kind of creating a standardized platform that people could design on. And That's you did right. this because yeah. you were willing to collaborate yeah. with the early fabulous companies as they came along and uh -huh. developed that standard, uh -huh. I think. It, it and, and, and that's what we're, we're trying to do in MEMS. Uh, uh, yeah. So when you spun out of uh, ITRI, uh, do you think that could have been done just uh, as a start, or did, was it really important to have a government foundation there and it kind of spun out of that? And the second question then is, is that a useful model to think in, in terms of manufacturing uh, generally around the world, or especially in the U.S., uh, spinning out manufacturing capability out of our national labs? I, I really think that um, uh, the Taiwan, the TSMC, ITRI, Taiwan, um, the three were in combination. I think that was a pretty unique one. Uh, uh, first of all, I didn't go to Taiwan to start TSMC at all. I went to Taiwan to, to be the president of history. Mm -hmm. And I thought I was going to retire in that job, you know. <laughs> uh, and uh, the person that recruited me to that job was a it was, was not the same person that asked me to start TSMC. In fact, the two of them uh, were not friendly to each other, you know. <laughs> and uh, the person that eventually asked me to start TSMC uh, was unhappy because um, the other guy had recruited me to the itchy job. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, uh, Two weeks after I arrived in the ITRI job, uh, this other minister, who was unhappy because he didn't recruit me, uh, asked me to, to go to see him. And at that time, he said, uh, you ought to start TSMC. Uh, and uh, well, of course, uh, he had he, he, he didn't really understand semiconductor industry very well. So when he said you ought to start a semiconductor company, he meant uh, something like the conventional IDM. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, uh, but I came up uh, with a uh, different, uh, with the TSMC business model. Yeah. Uh, different uh, game plan. Yeah, different game plan. And uh, he, he had the confidence in me because, because he knew what I had done uh, at TI. Mm -hmm. uh, so, 
So uh, he, he trusted me. Uh, so even though he didn't understand what a foundry was, uh, 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 he, he trusted me. Yeah. So do you think it was a unique situation, or could that model be more generally expanded? I think, I think it was a pretty unique situation. You, you first, uh, you, you have to start with the insight that uh, uh, the Taiwan government had uh, back 10 years earlier, in 1975, when they started this uh, the seed group, uh, mm. this development group uh, in Italy. Uh, it was pretty big money for them at that time. It was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, even just just the RCA contract, uh, the technology transfer contract, uh, was uh, four or five million dollars, which was big money for for the Taiwan government at that time. Mm -hmm. And then sustaining uh, their own development activity, uh, that probably cost uh, a few million dollars a year, you know. And that was pretty big money uh, for the Taiwan government, but they did it. Uh, uh. And then, of course, uh, uh, when the time came, uh, when I started to set up uh, TSMC, and uh, the, the premier, the second minister, uh, and the premier said they would support 50%. They didn't know that it was going to be 50% of 220 million. <laughs> They, they thought it was a much smaller number than that, yeah. But, but they swallowed that uh, also, so. So it, it was- I'll bet they're happy they swallowed that. Oh, yeah. They were, they, oh yeah, they, well, they're very happy now. Maybe. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, recently, um, some people claim that um, beyond 20, uh, 28 nanometers, the cost per transistor is not going to scale. They say that 28 nanometer is the last technology node that has and is going to have basically the lowest cost. Uh, could you comment on that, or do you do you believe it? John, this? can you repeat that? To the me? question is: uh, below 28 nanometers, will we get any cost improvements in the price of per transistor? Uh, some people claim that's the end of the road in terms of price drops per transistor. Well. Uh, I think it, it, it does become more difficult, but I think uh, it will still happen. Uh, now, I think there's a controversy going on, and uh, whatever, uh, but uh, I would say that uh, uh, it will continue to happen. We'll still get lower, lower costs, transistor, maybe not the decrease in, in cost, maybe will not be at the same rate right. as it happened before, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Uh, Chairman, considering yeah. your love for literature, is there an autobiography in the works? <laughs> what? Is there an autobiography in the works? Well, actually, I wrote one in Chinese, in Chinese, <laughs> uh, and it was it was a bestseller uh, in Taiwan. In Taiwan, uh, yeah. it, appropriately uh, so. <laughs> uh, it was the envy of a lot of professional writers uh, in Taiwan. Huh? Uh, uh, we sold uh, almost two hundred thousand copies, which was uh, a which constituted a very good seller in in Taiwan. <laughs> And in fact, I had, it trans I had it translated it into English by a couple of professional translators, but I didn't like the translation. I didn't like the result. Uh, and Shakespeare uh, wasn't available, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't publish it. I didn't publish the English version of it. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Hi, th thank you. Um, I think you'll like this one. Um, any advice to a startup that sp specializes in buying and selling primarily uh, secondary uh, semiconductor manufacturing equipment on uh, <laughs> how to start a new Would relationship with TSMC? A startup that specializes in buying and selling of, of used semiconductor yes, equipment? Yes, yes. And we just actually started oh, a new office in Taiwan. I have to think about that. I, 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 think, I, I, I do think there's a market for that, yes. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, you know, uh, even, even today, if uh, we would be interested in buying uh, some uh, used uh, equipment. Uh, uh, 
but but whether I I would advise um, uh, a startup like that, uh, I I don't know. I have to think about that. Yeah, <laughs> but there is a market for it. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a market. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a market. Other questions? Yes. So I have a question. Reading, if you read Macbeth just before you go to sleep, doesn't it give you nightmares? <laughs> <laughs> Thinking of the witches there. Well, yeah. I, I generally, uh, even though I'm, I'm primarily interested in Shakespeare's uh, tragedies, but for bedtime reading. Uh, Romeo and Juliet a lot. Well, that's a tragedy too, I guess. Or, or perhaps The Merchant of Venice. Yes, anyway. okay. There we go. There we go. I represent the uh, fabulous industry. We started a company, a semiconductor company in Connecticut. Uh, the name of it was Transwitch. We used your foundry. Uh, and it uh, worked out beautifully. Uh, it's a wonderful business model to have fabulous. Uh, in in your capabilities, and as you point out, it's key to the industry itself. But I want to thank you and keep up your foundry. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I also, before we we finish, I also want to say that uh, uh, the uh, Jensen actually referred to. Uh, by being on uh, honeymoon uh, when I talked when I visited him. The year, by the way, uh, uh, was not 1999. <laughs> it, it, it was uh, 2001. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now, but uh, what I want to say is that uh, ever since then, you know, uh, I think Sophie's support has been very, very important. And when Jensen refers to by last five years, my last five years being the CEO again uh, of TSMC. Uh, actually, I didn't become CEO again at the age of 75, as you said. I became CEO again at the age of 78. <laughs> but, but anyway, last uh, 10 or 11 years, uh, uh, well, uh, actually 13 years, I think Sophie's uh, support uh, was uh, most significant. Uh, I, I must Picking your right, the right life partner is another important oh, yeah. lesson oh, I can yeah. learn in life. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hi. Well said, John. Well said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For you, Morris, uh, I was, it's a non-technical and non-business question. How do you kick your smoking habit? I know you used to smoke when you were in graduate school. How did I kick it? Yeah. How do you kick it? Or you have ever kicked it? I haven't. I really haven't kicked it. No. <laughs> uh, you know, my my philosophy on smoking is this. I, I smoke a pipe, by the way. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I know that uh, pipe smoking, well, pipe smoking, I think, is better than than cigarette smoking. <laughs> I, in fact, I have read statistics. Yeah. But say, it's not in the good column, Morris. It's not in the good column? <laughs> no. Uh, well, it's better. That's, that's what you say. But the statistics I saw say that a pipe smoker actually lives longer than a non smoker. Really? Yeah. <laughs> And uh, the way I see it, the way I this see it. This is in a journal for pipe smokers, I'm sure. <laughs> the way I see it is that while uh, pipe smoking is uh, injurious to your physical health, but maybe it helps your mood. Maybe yeah. It, you have, yeah. And, and I, I think it, the, the, a person's uh, mood is very yeah. important yeah. to his health. You know. I, I try a nice <laughs> glass of red wine. I think. <laughs> That's right. That's All right. right. Let's get another question here. So Dr. Chen, I have a question. Um, now everybody knows, you know, these data integrated circuits process, you know, the circuit design complexity is getting higher and higher, so the process is more complicated. But at the same time, the consumer electronics side are demanding, you know, faster time to market, being able to deliver a product in a shorter life cycle. So in your view, how do, how do you or, you know, what would be the challenge facing forward and balance out the, these two different requirements that are coming I'm, in, in I'm the... Sorry. 
John, maybe you can. I, I think the question revolves around um, the complexity of circuit design and logic design now with these complex chips has become really significant. I mean, look at Jensen's products, for example. And yet there's demand to deliver products in ever shorter periods of time. How do you see those two really meshing together and being resolved? Well, I, I think that uh, there is a tendency that uh, the uh, fabulous companies uh, uh, are, con are consolidating. You know? I think there'll be fewer uh, in uh, five years uh, or ten years. So. Uh, they are, they are I think some of them uh, uh, will be acquired by others. So, so do you think we'll see a model? Jensen will be acquiring people. Yeah, he'll be buying acquired, people, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, will a model emerge? I mean, if you look at how Intel does design, they have multiple teams working sort of in a, yeah. in a leapfrog fashion, yeah. one yeah. after the other, because the design takes so long. And yeah. perhaps we'll see more of that emerge over time. Yeah. Okay, we have one more question. Dr. Chen, uh, I have a question about your decision uh, of going back to Taiwan. Um, you were a really very successful uh, person in PI uh, back in 1985. And what do you see in Taiwan that makes you give you the courage to go back to Taiwan? Well, I uh, felt that, um, uh, well, actually at TI, I did not achieve uh, what I wanted to achieve. Uh, which was the CEO job at the end. Yeah. Uh, he only headed the entire semiconductor unit, but it... Uh, so uh, now, uh, by uh, 1983, uh, I was actually told uh, very plainly that I would not be the CEO of TI. So I left in that year. I went to General Instrument mm. in New York. Um, to become their COO with the expectation that I would become the CEO in perhaps uh, three or four years. Uh, now, after a year, however, in general instrument, although I still could be CEO in another two or three years, but I decided I would not want to be the CEO of General Instrument. Mm -hmm. So I was now at uh, a crossroads. Uh, uh, I was in a company uh, when I really, where I really didn't want to, to be the CEO. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, now at that time, uh, Taiwan began to beckon. Uh, so. I decided that that would be a, a, a good, uh, a, it was, it was a, a risk, but uh, you know, uh, I was uh, about, uh, I was 54 years old. I felt I could still afford to take uh, a risk. Uh, 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 and uh, I had achieved uh, a measure of financial independence uh, uh, with my uh, TI and the general instrument uh, uh, stock options, all that sort of things. Uh, uh, it's nothing like uh, what you would consider wealth today, you mm. know. But uh, financial independence to me meant at that time that uh, I didn't need a job. Uh, uh, I, mean, could, I could just live on the interest of, uh, of uh, my, uh, the money I had. Uh, which, which was true, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, interest rate was actually high at that time, too. <laughs> <laughs> but still, uh, still, I, I, I did have a financial independence, uh, so I decided to take a risk. Uh, yeah. uh, and that road less taken is what turned you into an engineering hero. I think well, it's really remarkable. <laughs> thank you.